He is part of the PDA, Performance Disability Art Collective, and co-program Crip Your World, an intergalactic queer POC and disabled extravaganza. In 2014, he wrote an essay about PDA for Disability Futures in the Arts, the three-year essay series I've been curating, which is published by Word Gathering. He is co-editor of the best-selling Until We Are Free, Reflections on Black Lives Matter in Canada, and has also co-edited Queering Urban Justice, Queer of Color Formations in Toronto, and Marvelous Grounds, Queer of Color Histories of Toronto. Cyrus is a core team member of Black Lives Matter Toronto and a co-curator of Blackness Yes, Blockorama. He is also on the executive team of the Wild Seed Center for Art and Activism and a faculty member of the inaugural Black Arts Fellowship. Cyrus has won several awards, including the TD Diversity Award in 2017, was voted Best Queer Activist by Now Magazine in 2005, and was awarded the Steinert and Ferrero Award in 2012. I first met Cyrus when we were invited by Elizabeth Sweeney, who was also shown in the exhibit, to be on the jury for the first Canada Council for the Arts funding specifically for disability arts organizations in Canada. The jury granted over $1 million over three years to disability arts organizations in Canada. When I started to think about curating, cripping the, queering the crip, cripping the queer, Cyrus was one of the first artists I knew had to be part of the exhibit. Throughout, I knew his incredibly incisive and imaginative video, Ancestors Can You Read Us, Dispatches from the Future, would end the exhibit with the crucial message that what we do today as artists, as activists, as humans, will be important for future generations. In this way, Cyrus's video extends queer disability history into the future and connects generations who need to think about not only what has come before, but what also comes after. Cyrus is perhaps the most dynamic artist working in Canada today, connecting activism and art, experience with education, and scholarship with action. I am honored that his work is part of Queering the Crip, Cripping the Queer, and so grateful he is able to be with, with here, here with us at the Schulis Museum in Berlin tonight. Thank you so much, Kenny. Thank you for curating my work and thank you all for coming tonight. We're gonna um, do our best with some tech glitches, but we're just gonna go through what we can get through in this PowerPoint. And I'm so excited to be here. I'm based in Toronto, uh, colonially known as Toronto, but uh, known in Haudenosaunee as Toronto and also as Tagarando. So really honored to get to live in the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee the Anishinaabe, um, the Huron-Wendat, and other communities. Where I'm from is home to Three Fires Confederacy, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Dishwood Ones in Wampum. And it's really important to understand the context of what we would call Indigenous resurgence in the context of making this work. Uh, you'll see in the video, there are Indigenous people in the future. There are Afro-Indigenous people in the future. There are Black people in the future. We make it. Um, so my name is Cyrus. I'm an artist, an activist, um, and a scholar. I'm co-founder of Black Lives Matter Canada and Wild Seed Center for Art and Activism. And I've been on the front lines doing organizing for about 26 years, about the same amount of time that I've been an artist. My art and my activism have always gone hand in hand and been interconnected. And I'm really interested in thinking through how to do activism in a creative way and thinking through how to do art in an activist way and how to bring these things together. Um, so I'm really invested, this is a still from the, the video, I'm really invested in this idea of abolition, of abolitionist futures, because I think if we're going to get to the future that's in this video, where our great-grandchildren have survived until 2072 and they've come back to tell us, here's what needs to happen, overthrow capitalism, solve climate change, and white supremacy, like these are the things that need to happen. If we're gonna get there, we need to get rid of one of the biggest dangers to black bodies in this current moment, which is targeted policing and policing. So uh, as a member of Black Lives Matter, we um, started in 2016 pushing for the police to collect race-based data so that we could have a better understanding of who was being stopped by the police, who was being detained, and who was being harmed by the police. 
And the data just came out. It just came out two weeks ago, finally. And the data shows what we have been saying forever, which is that black people are disproportionately stopped, disproportionately frisked, and disproportionately uh, having what they call use of force or bodily harm enacted on them. So for anyone who's not sighted or has low vision, what's on the screen right now is a collage that I made that really took very little editing. It's an image of the police throwing tear gas canisters in Ferguson in the United States during the racial uprising. And they seem to be doing it with joy. And what I've done is I've outlined their figures with different colors and at the bottom it says, we take care of each other. And it also says defund the police. So, you know, moving from 2016 until uh, and, and organizing with Black Lives Matter, we've been pushing for alternatives to policing. But it was really during the uprisings of 2020 when the call for abolition moved from quiet corners and kitchen table conversations to the news to, you know, large scale media outlets. Uh, what's on the screen now is a collage of police officers um, tackling somebody during the G20 protests in Toronto, but it's uh, replicated and mirrored so that they almost look like insects uh, crawling on this person. And it says defund police in the middle. So in 2020, a lot of things happened. Of course, the pandemic started. We were all inside in a different way. Um, uh, and we saw a lot of people becoming politicized through online engagement. They were watching webinars, they were going to talks and talking about abolition. More and more people were talking about abolition. And then, of course, May 2020 happened. And we saw the killing of George Floyd uh, in the States and um, the police brutality surrounding that. In Toronto, where I'm from, there was the killing of Regis Korczynski Paquette, um, who was a black mad woman um, who was uh, killed by police in just shortly after, just in the beginning of June. And that began an entire summer of just case after case after case. You heard about Jacob Blake. You heard about uh, Breonna Taylor. You heard about all these names, black people being affected by policing. And there was this widespread call for abolition and more so to defund the police, to take funding from bloated police resources and reinvest them into the community. So what would it take if we you know, had the $30 billion police budget and took 10% of that and invested that in schools or community centers or parks or, or other things in our community that would actually benefit us? How would things like houselessness or so-called crime actually decrease if we had the resources we needed to actually have functional communities. So in, 20, uh, in June of 2020, we launched uh, a big campaign to defund the police. We launched a website, defundthepolice.org, that had all sorts of answers to all of the burning questions that you get when you start to talk to people about abolition. As soon as you start to talk about abolition of police, people say, what are you talking about? What would we do without police? as if police create safety, which we know that they don't. So this website had resources on what to do if your neighbor and you are in a conflict. How could you solve that without you know, responding to police? What to do if someone in your community is going through an emotional crisis? How can you support mad people without calling the police? And then what happens uh, when there is a case of harm? You know, What do we do? So this website kind of helped us to get the message out to a broad range of people. And then on Juneteenth, which is June 19th, uh, it's a day uh, in North America that is set aside to commemorate the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation, and more specifically, the, ad the adoption of the Emancipation Proclamation in Texas, which was the state that was a holdout that wouldn't free the, the enslaved people on slave labor camps. June 19th commemorates the finally agreeing to the Emancipation Proclamation by Texas, but it also commemorates significant moments in Black liberation that happened during the month of June, including the Nat Turner Rebellion. Nat Turner was a Black enslaved person who started a rebellion on his slave labor camp and freed a lot of people, but also died in the process. So Juneteenth is a significant day, but it's also in the middle of Pride Month. <laughs> It's right in the middle of Pride Month, and we are a queer and trans-led group. You know, we are led by trans women, Black trans women, and led by non-binary queer and trans people. 
And so we knew that we wanted to make a statement on Juneteenth, and we knew we wanted it to be as queer a statement as we could possibly make. So we went to our local hardware store and got a couple of big buckets of very, very, very queer, very, very, very pink paint. And at eight in the morning, we went to right in front of police headquarters. And I had gone in advance and figured out the measurements. The artist on the team always has to do the reconnaissance for these things. I had figured out the measurements. We just hit it and started painting. We worked with 80 artists and we intentionally worked with a lot of contemporary artists who were allies to our movement in part because we knew that the risk of arrest is different for different communities. We also knew the implications of an arrest would be different for some of these very well-known contemporary white cis artists the, the the impact would be different on them if there was arrest that happened. So anyways, we, we got people together. I'm hoping this will work. Uh, we're gonna play the sound from my uh, bit computer, but this is what we ended up making. And what's on the screen for folks who are listening, who aren't looking at the screen, is an image of activists painting on the street. So what it says on the screen is thank you to the 80 artists who helped us with this intervention. And the music is by Tribe Called Red or The Hallucination and Shad K. So this is what the mural looks like. So what's on the screen now is an image that's an aerial view shot with a drone of College Street in Toronto. And it's about two blocks wide. And what you're seeing is giant queer pink letters that say defund the police in block letters. And what you, what you can sort of see in the photo, but not totally, is all of the police officers who were standing there who had poured out of police headquarters to watch us paint this unsure quite what to do, right? I mean, this is rush hour, this is eight in the morning. By the time we were done was about 8.30, 8.35, you know, key prime gridlock time, the entire intersection blocked off. We used so many creative methods to be able to make this, including the banners, which were created by textile artist Jenna Reed. Um, and the banners allowed us to sort of block off the intersections. The banners said for all black lives and black lives matter. Um, and it was, on this mural, standing on the mural with you know news cameras everywhere that we announced our demands uh, and the demands included defunding the police, reinvesting in our communities, supporting libraries, community centers, parks, schools, daycares, childcare, you know, food programs, et cetera, and how that would benefit our communities. So um, this was our celebration of pride. This was how we celebrated our pride that year. We didn't march in the parade, we did this. This was our uh, commemoration. And it was a direct response to the uprisings and all of the activism that we were seeing. There were sister murals that were created in other cities. Some cities had much harsher police, I mean, our police force is very harsh. But in Hamilton, which is about an hour away from Toronto, when they started making their mural, as they were painting it this way, the police were erasing it the other way. Like they were just erasing each letter, spray washing it as they were finishing. So, you know, this was uh, quite a feat to get to do this. And then to bring you to the title of the talk, Pink, Pink Splatches, in, Ju in July, the following month, we, we decided that we wanted to continue our queering of public space. 
And we also wanted to specifically talk about the ways that the police system, which grows out of slave labor camps, the slave catcher forces became the police forces, the RCMP, which is our Royal Canadian Mounted Police, specifically were created to clear the land of Indigenous people. That was the, their sole purpose when they were created. So the police and the RCMP were directly connected to Black and Indigenous um, uh, internment. And so we wanted to draw attention to the fact that these were monuments to slavery and colonialism. By supporting policing, you're supporting slavery and colonialism. So we decided to bring our attention to some other monuments to slavery and colonialism that were scattered around, throughout the city, including uh, this monument, which is a monument to uh, Egerton Ryerson, who was a violent, genocidal white supremacist who started the, what they call the residential school system, which, is this, uh, not, which was not a school, but a series of, um, of enslavement camps for indigenous children, where they tried to take the indigeneity out of these children, prevented them from speaking their language, practicing um, their ceremonies. Um, and there was a lot of violence. A lot of uh, children's bodies are being found. Their remains are being found on the remains of these schools. Um, so anyways, he's a, but also a university was named after him. <laughs> he's very uh, complicated and very big figure in, in Canada. And then this is actually a statue of King Edward VI that was up in India and during a decolonial process was taken down by the people. They were like, we don't want this colonizer in our city. And then someone in Toronto who was independently wealthy purchased it and had it put in Queens Park, right in the middle of our city. So we were like, no, 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 no. And then the other statue that we wanted to address was Johnny McDonald, which was our first prime minister. And he was very anti-Indigenous and anti-Black. And he... Um, you know, did a lot of things to try to uh, eradicate Indigenous people from the land. So um, again, in very early in the morning, uh, we, with a bunch of activists, came and beautified these statues. They were ugly because they represented such violence, and we decided to beautify them in a particular way. And so pink paint was added, um, and we added banners that said, tear down monuments to slavery and colonialism. Um, and they were attached to all of the, the statues. This time the police did act. So at the last site, we went to three different sites and at the last site, the police came, uh, they arrested three people, they detained them for almost 40 hours. Um, people were denied their medication. There was a lot of violence that happened that day and we had a big rally in front of police, uh, Toronto Police Services where they were being held. Um, and we rallied until four in the morning when they were finally released. Uh, the very next day, we held a press conference in front of the statue of Egerton Ryerson. And it was at this press conference that Raven Wings, uh, who's a black trans woman, an Afro-Indigenous trans woman, co-founder of Black Lives Matter Canada with me, she got on the microphone and she made this speech that was rebroadcast everywhere. Like Madonna shared it, Rihanna shared it, you know, like, you name it, it was shared all over. So um, I'm sorry, I didn't visually describe the previous slides, but if you can imagine, they were ugly colonizer statues with gorgeous queer pink paint on them. So that's what you just were looking at. And now this is the video of Raven. I'll hopefully get the sound going. Um, we've tried many different ways to get the attention and the conversation of those in leadership roles and positions. It took us having to do this to get y'all to show up. Yeah. Yeah. We've been writing letters. Yeah. We've been creating books, yeah. yes. photography, yes. performance art. We've been doing it in every single way possible to let you know what we deserve, what we need. And you don't even have to dream it up. We've done the work for you. And so it's really ridiculous to me that we're still talking about monuments. Outrageous, outrageous, yes. It's really ridiculous to me that we have to fight for our dignity. You know, in the United States, there's a saying, life, liberty, and justice. Black people are still in life. Yes, yes. We haven't gotten anything else. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right, and it's in the technology of blackness 
the refined abolition and technology of black women, right? The refined radical love and intersectionality, the technology of black trans folks. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. In leadership roles to make sure that you question. And this is not easy work. This is not fame work. We're destabilized. We're hyper surveilled. We're followed. And just like this, we need to create a humanity where everyone and everything is allowed to exist because we already do. Yes. See, white supremacy is creating a society, an ideal of a society, and using the state to enforce it. And this is what we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. Before y'all became white, you were something else. Mm -hmm. And we were something else. And we've had to fight in your delusion, your white supremacist delusion for far too long. Mm -hmm. You're lucky that this is all we did. You're lucky that we're appealing to your humanity. Yes. Yes. You're yes. lucky yes. that we're not asking for vengeance yes. Yes. or revenge, because that's easy. But our love is radical. Mm -hmm. It's abolitionist. It's a future where each and everybody has what they need, what they deserve, what they want. It's raising a kid who's four years old, who's not afraid of the police. Mm -hmm. Just to remind you of why we're here. So you can see why that speech went around the world. It was very, very powerful and this idea that before y'all became white, you were something else and we were something else is so powerful. And, the, and how much harm has been done to all of us by systems of white supremacy, you know? And she's really encouraging us. So I was totally blown away by what she said. We were so tired. We had been up until four in the morning, at least. That's when we left the police station. This press conference was at eight in the morning. You know, I've said to Raven, how did you do that? And she said it just came to her. You know, in that moment, she was so frustrated that these statues were given more care than the lives of the activists. There was a disabled mad woman who was denied her medication. She, like, a lot could have happened, you know, but these statues were given more care. So in the aftermath, they boarded up the statues. So what's on the screen right now is an image of Queen's Park, the governmental building of Toronto. Uh, and there's a big wooden box. And in that box is the statue of John McDonald. So rather than dealing with taking it down or keeping it up or cleaning it off, they just boarded it up. They blockaded it up. And they wrote this plaque. There's a picture of the plaque. The plaque on the wall of the cabin that they built for it says, though we cannot change the history we have inherited, we can shape the history we wish to leave behind. The Speaker of the Legislative Assembly is considering how the depictions of those histories in the monuments and statuary on the Assembly's grounds can respect all our diverse cultures and peoples. So this was put up at a time when all over the city, people were living in housing encampments, tents, sleeping bags, sleeping and living in parks because there's not enough affordable housing in the city. There was a black man, Khalil C. Wright, who started building what he called tiny homes, these tiny shelters that were able to be put in parks so that people who were wintering over living in the park would have a shelter to live in. So there were these tiny homes that he built. He built a couple hundred of these tiny homes and they were put all over. And the city was like, absolutely not. They're a fire hazard, yank them out. So they yanked them out, they destroyed them. He paid for them, he did all the work. They, it, this was a solution, a temporary solution to their problem of houselessness, but they couldn't do it. They teared it out. They destroyed it. So all of these people who were living in parks had no home. It looks exactly like the home that was built for the statue, which is okay. So the statue is literally getting more housing than most of my neighbors, right? So it's just really quite outrageous that, as Raven says, it's amazing that we're still talking about statues. So luckily... Um, 
After our demonstration, not all of the statues remained in a tiny box. This is Egerton Ryerson. Um, during an indigenous resurgence protest, when they were discovering more and more of these unmarked graves on the quote unquote school grounds, um, there were lots of organizing that was happening in the city. There was a big rally at Ryerson in front of the statue and indigenous activists yanked the statue down it fell to the ground. They didn't stop there. They cut the head of the statue off, um, put it on a stick at 1492 Landback Lane, which is the site of indigenous resistance and resurgence where people have been organizing around the occupation of the Haldeman Track, which is this area in uh, uh, Toronto near Six Nations. So that's what ended up happening. Oh, and I think they also dunk it in, the, in Lake Ontario. There was a whole process of what happened to this uh, colonizer. Um, so anyways, I've been really interested in this idea of irresistible revolutions. And so Tony Cade Bambera, who's a black theorist and filmmaker, she said in 1982 that the role, or 83, the role of the artist from the oppressed or marginalized community was to make the revolution irresistible. That literally our job is to make the revolution irresistible. And she said that sometimes we do that just by getting up as black people. That's enough. But I've been really interested in this idea of artistic practice sparking revolutions that seem so possible and so probable that you can't help but want to get involved. So I was thinking about Raven's speech and I kept coming back to what she said when she said our love is radical, it's abolitionist, you know? And that it's in the technology of black women that we find love um, and it's in the technology of blackness that we come to abolition. So I ended up creating this project called Radical Love um, that was an offering of an alternative monument. So if we were successful in tearing all of these monuments down, if what happened to the Ryerson statue happened to all of the statues, what's on the screen now is just a black screen that says Radical Love. Um, if, you, if, we, if we tore down all of these monuments, what, if anything, would we put up in their place? Like what would be considered appropriate and valuable in our contemporary world? So I did a bunch of interviews with Black and Afro-Indigenous trans women and non-binary trans people specifically and asked them about their experiences in public space. And I was really curious about how when they were moving out through the city, what was their experience of these monuments and these statuary? And so I asked you know, all of these people these different questions about their experience in public space and seeing themselves reflected. And of course we know what I found out, trans people don't see themselves reflected very rarely in public space. But also, Raven talked about feeling safer walking at two in the morning than at 2 p.m. because there was less chance of people and less chance of transphobic violence as a result. So she was doing her walking and traversing on the city in the middle of the night. And I was like, oh my gosh, it's you know, what, is it, what are the implications of that when we've created a world that is so unsafe for trans women, in particular Black trans women in the daytime, that they have to do all of their travel at night? So I was given the opportunity to create a series of projects under this uh, underpass, this art gallery underpass called the Bentway, and I knew what I was going to do. I was like, I'm going to make some monuments that glow in the middle of the night so that for the trans people who are walking, they not only see themselves reflected, but there's this light box, this glowing message for them that they are wanted, that they are expected here. So this is my proposition for a different kind of monument. So we have a portrait of Monica Forrester, who's a black trans woman who's been doing street-based outreach for at least since 1980. Um, we have Chris Sai, who's a young, I think he's going to law school now, but a, a, a non-binary black trans person. And then of course, portraits of Raven Wings. Um, and so they were uh, designed to glow in the day. These are some of the portraits. So there's a portrait of a black trans non-binary person with a, a floral jacket on and a white shirt standing on a beach. And his, their image is mirrored, uh, like top and bottom. And then in the middle, there's an image of Monica Forrester, a black trans woman in a red and black flower dress with purple lipstick and she's smiling at the camera. And then on the far right, there's a portrait of Raven Wings looking incredibly glamorous, sitting on a picnic bench. I never look like that when I sit on a picnic bench. And um, she has short black hair, green eyeshadow, a long rose quartz crystal hanging from her neck, 
and she's sort of exuding this confidence. Um, so these were what the images look like. Um, they also were very visible in the day. So this is a daytime installation shot of a highway overpass with these three monuments uh, located under them. And what I did was I was so interested in what they had told me, their stories about their feelings of safety and everything. So I had decided to record some audio. So I asked them about their experiences in public space. And I also asked them to describe for me their ideal city. Like if they could create any city that they wanted, what would it look like? What would it feel like? And I recorded this audio and put it on a website so that you could come to the installation and listen to their voices talking about safety, talking about the city while you watch this, but you could also just listen to it at any point. Um, the show got a lot of press, which was great to get trans stories, uh, you know, front and foreground. Um, this is the website. Uh, it's a black screen with um, white lettering that says Radical Love, a digital exhibition. And there's transcriptions that go with the audio so that it's accessible in a variety of formats. Um, and so that was what Radical Love was. It was this proposition for a different kind of monument and a different kind of art project directly relating back to what Raven Wings had said that our love was radical and it was abolitionist. So now here we are in 2020, almost 2023, and a lot has happened. As I mentioned, we finally just got the race-based data from the police. So now we're able to sort of act on that. Uh, what the city has done uh, since th this project was only up for, you know, it's the art project, it was up for six months or something like that. But um, what the city has now done is uh, reinvest in the police, not defund the police. They got the data that said that black people were disproportionately affected by policing. And what they decided to do was to give the police a whole bunch of money to hold some town hall meetings where people could talk about their feelings about the data. So I was like, you're refunding the police, you realize that. So anyways, that's what's been happening in the city. Um, there's still a lot of organizing around the people who are living houseless in tents in the park, and that statue is still boarded up, still with more housing than most of my neighbors, as I mentioned. But here we are, we're in a moment where we're moving out of hopefully, out of this pandemic into something else. And this has been the call right now is, what kind of city do we want to live in? What kind of community do we want to emerge into after COVID, after all of these, uh, the pandemic of racial violence, after all of that? And so I've been really excited about uh, this project, Ancestors, Do You Read Us? Dispatches from the Future, because it offers a little bit of a hope that maybe where we're headed after this moment that we find ourselves in now is one, I don't know if you've seen the video, but they're in an open field. There's grass, there's living things, there's sunlight, there's black disabled people, there's trans people, there's indigenous people, like there's children, you know, it, there, and there is a world where we all get to make it. And that's what I'm kind of invested in. I think that's my last slide. Um, so I'll just uh, do this. <laughs> but um, it's been amazing to get to tell you a little bit about those uprisings and a little bit about those projects. And I would be so happy to take questions and to engage with all of you. Um, because of what happened with the arrests, you know, I mean, it was a very serious thing. Uh, these three people had that follow them around. You know, they had a year of conditions. It was a year before the charges were finally dropped. And it's probably going to be a traumatic experience that will linger. So, you know, the effects of policing are very real. And I think if we're going to make a world that is safer for Black people, and in particular for Black trans people, we need to, at the very least, defund the police and hopefully so much more, create abolitionist communities where we respond to conflict and crisis and harm in ways that don't rely on policing. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, you. Cyrus. And for those that haven't seen the video, it's right around the corner <laughs> in the in the other room, and it's also um, featured in the exhibition site online. So, um, questions, comments, um, Kate, you want to start? That way, I can leave my mask on. <laughs> Um, first of all, thank you so, so very much for sharing that with us today. It's such an honor to have you here and 
Kenny and I, I think, when, when Kenny announced that you were coming, I was so excited. Oh, I'm still very you. excited. Thank so you. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm oh, one of the co curators. Great to meet you. <laughs> Good to meet you too. Um, sorry if I'm overexcited and too overexcited and not, not articulate enough, but I'll do my best. Um, I think that, you know, so much of what you're saying is um, very much what we tried to sort of encapsulate in the show, I guess, that there is such heavy, dark history for so many queer and disabled and trans people and how you then move forward uh, as a community or communities um, or as allies to those communities is a really difficult and complex question, I think. And I think, you know, I like to see you as very much a, a role model, I guess, of, in how it could be done. Yeah. Um, but my, that's just a bit of kind of, you know, gushing about how wonderful you are. But my actual question is, um, to what extent do you work with other people around the world? Because this is not a, obviously not a unique problem to Toronto. We see this happening here in Berlin. I mean, it's a fantastic example of colonial history here and how violent the city is here for so many people. So how can we all, how can we speak to each other? How can we work with each other internationally so that we can try and change things and I'd really love to know more about what you're already doing I think I've heard you speak about this before but I'd love to hear you maybe give us an update about you know are you working with other people in other cities in other movements and and groups and how can we sort of join forces and absolutely yeah, yeah thank you so much for this question and I think you know, so much of what we have to remember is that borders are fictitious. <laughs> you know, if you just follow the butterfly, it'll show you a different route. You know, it's not going to go through a checkpoint. It's it's different. So, and blackness, of course, is borderless. You know, there are black people literally everywhere, including in Antarctica. So literally we are everywhere. So thinking about it in that realm, it's like a big problem. It's a global problem. And certainly in 2020, we saw a lot of sister movements all over People in Brazil were talking about defunding the police. People in the UK were talking about defunding the police. It was really a message that was we were hearing loud and clear. And this question of what our city looks like, what our city feels like, is really true in so many places where there, there's this legacy of colonial impact or legacy of war or other traumatic events that, that bring up. And this question of what we keep and what we take down is, a, is super important. So I've been really fortunate to be connected to Black Lives Matter UK and to some of the organizing that they're doing there. We're connected to Black Lives Matter Brazil and some of the organizing that they're doing there. I recently went to, just before the pandemic, I went to um, Australia and I was uh, working specifically with indigenous activists from there and indigenous activists from Northern Turtle Island. And we were thinking through these big questions about city, about place, about possibility. So I think that it's starting to happen. It is already happening. But one of the things that I think we need is we need to turn to disabled people to say, how do we stay connected over long distances? Disabled people know how to stay connected over long distances really well. We were using the internet. We were meeting on, we didn't have Zoom, but we had other ways to connect long before the able-bodied world suddenly was all over Zoom in 2020, right? Like we've been doing this for a while. So if we turned to disabled, deaf, and mad people and said, how do you stay connected over distance? We would learn a lot, you know? So I've been really thinking about that and about what we can learn from disabled wisdom and knowledge. Um, that's part of it. And I think that this virtual space, you know, creates like a liminal space that is a little bit borderless that we get to experience. And then as much as possible, I've been trying to think through what would it mean for us to... Um, defund the border. I don't know how else, how else to say it, but to to divest from, to try to find a way to divest. We have Canadian Border Services Agency that really controls and patrols the border, but really to think about our work transnationally and really to think about our work in a broader sense, because if we, there are so many more of us than them, and if we rose up together or, or rose together in whatever way that we did, a lot could happen. Um, so I'm really interested in that. And I think that people who are interested in this topic can go to defundthepolice.org and find resources that are relevant to here in the same way that we can tap into what's happening with BLM UK or what some of the Indigenous allies are doing in Australia. We can learn from each other and, and grow together. Yeah, so thank you. Others? Yep. Yeah. 
Uh, hi, thank you um, so much um, also for uh, the talk and introducing us to some of your work. Um, I have two questions. Um, one is, is about the, um, the your activist work. So I don't know how to separate those two things, but um, specifically about the, um, the push to get the data recorded on uh, race from uh, the police. Uh, in the German context, uh, there's no um, categorizing of that. There's no uh, information on that either. I think um, a lot of times I encounter this um, discussion where it's it's about uh, the unique history that, that this these categorizations have in Germany, and that that's one of the reasons why it's not done, mm -hmm. um, which has this kind of like exceptionalist effect of 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 acting as if those categories are not also harmful in other places where they're used. Um, so I was kind of curious about, did you encounter opposition to that? Um, what were the kind of arguments that you made when you're um, having these discussions with people? Um, the second question that I wanted to ask was, um, I just like, uh, having seen your work, I love the, there's, there's just like a very positive energy to it. I don't know how to say uh, anything less cliche than that about it, but um, to just share with us um, what kind of work uh, that you draw upon for that inspiration? What artists do you have to you turn to for comfort? Um, maybe just to share with that. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, we definitely encountered a lot of resistance to the call to collect race-based data, including from the police who said that it was racist to collect race-based data. I was like, nice try. It just shows that you don't actually know what that word means. Thanks for proving that for us. But, um, but there was a lot of pushback to collecting it. Um, and of course, you know, we we made the argument that if there's nothing to worry about, then you should have no problem releasing the data. If you're not doing anything wrong, if there's not disproportionate stops, if you're saying that it's such a great racial environment, <laughs> then you should have nothing to be worried about. And we said that very publicly in the media. We repeated that message. So we did sort of strategies like that that kind of forced the issue. But also there was this phenomenon, and I don't know if you have this here, but we had this program that they called carding where they could stop you at any point and ask for your information, just friendly, just asking for your information, not charging you with anything, but just collecting your data in case they ran into you again. And surprise, surprise, the only people that they ever did that to was black people. I mean, sometimes indigenous or other racialized people, but it was mostly black people who were being carded. So we were able to sort of say like, hold on a minute, like let's get a sense of how bad the carding issue is by actually collecting the data. And so of course, now that we have the data, it's everything that we worried about and more, you know, like it's such disproportionate use of force and violence um, directed towards black people. So um, we were kind of, you know, this movement has a lot of young people in it, which is so exciting. I'm 45. So I'm one of the older people in my group and you know this movement is very in front of the camera it's that kind of a movement so a lot of what we do is very public and there's a safety in that and so in our demands about collecting the race-based data and why it was important anytime they would come back with something we would come back with something else in the press you know about well if you're not worried about it then you should start collecting it and so they ended up ended up having to start collecting it and as i say it's taken this many years it's been six years and so now they have this data so um i encourage people to to push for that because without the race-based data and you know the reality of what's happening with the German police system. You know that there's probably disproportionate stopping of particular communities. Not only racialized communities, trans people, disabled people are disproportionately stopped by police. If you start collecting race-based data, you're gonna be able to get a bit of a picture of what's happening, in particular if you can collect what's happening with the use of force. Um, so it's an essential move, and I think it would be worth advocating and fighting for. Um, you kind of need a bit of a pivotal moment in public opinion for the public to kind of sway. And we had, in 2016, we had occupied police headquarters for a 15-day outside, sleeping on the sidewalk, occupation of police headquarters during the coldest month of the year. And we were there for uh, 350 hours, for 15 full days. And the entire city was you know, on alert because there were these activists sleeping over and people were coming in and, and offering their support, not initially, but after the police reacted violently, people started coming in and offering their support. So all eyes were on us. So it was a good moment to push for the collection of the data. You do kind of need a moment to kind of, you know, a pivotal moment, but it is so useful if you can get it. 
Um, and then in relation to the second question, I'm really inspired. I mentioned Tony K. Bambera and this idea of irresistible revolutions, but um, my work is very much rooted in hope. Um, I really do believe that we're going to make it. Like, I really believe that we're going to make it. And I, I yeah, I think it's going to happen for us, you know, that we're going to survive this. But, um, you know, I've been inspired by speculative fiction writers who have imagined another future. So my friend, Adrienne Marie Brown, she often talks about the speculative fiction as a way of practicing the future, right? And I got to spend some time with Octavia Butler in the mid 2000s and, you know, got to ask her about her work and her writing and her process. And I asked her how she seemed to be able to predict the future because Parable of the Sower was written in 1993 and it's like exactly living out the way that the world is today up to and including a Trump-like figure in her book having literally the same campaign slogan. So in 2005, I asked her, I said, how did you do that? And she's like, no, 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 it's not prescience. It's nothing like that. I'm just literally following the course of human history. If I just follow this path and if we didn't change anything, like we didn't get better on racial politics, we didn't address climate, what might happen? I'm just imagining what might happen. And so I've been trying to do that. And what I've been trying to imagine is one, a, a future where we make it. And so this is part of why this is an instructional video. The great grandchildren come back and say, look, we're gonna make it, but only if you do these things, you know, so that it sort of compels us to that irresistible revolution in the now to help us kind of imagine. So I've been really drawn to speculative fiction writers to inspire me. Nalo Hopkinson, Octavia Butler, as I mentioned, and Kate Jamison, really interested in black speculative fiction writers who help us to dream another world. Walida Imarisha, she's the editor of a book called Octavia's Brood, which is all people writing in the spirit of Octavia Butler. It's such a good book if, you're, if you like short stories and you like speculative fiction, you'll love this book. Um, and in that book, Walida Imarisha talks about the um, that all activism is speculative fiction because it's daring to dream that another world is possible. So I've been really inspired by that. And it's like, what would it look like if we dared to dream that another world was possible? And so I've been trying to do that with my work. Thank you. Anybody else have anything to talk to Cyrus about? No. <laughs> so you can you you know everything to do now to to reach the future. Is that <laughs> we're gonna get there? Yeah. Okay then. Well, thank you so, ever so much. Thank Cyrus. you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to Kenny, to Karina, to the whole everyone at the Schulis Museum. Schule, I hope I'm saying it right. Museum at Kenroy and So um, uh, it's been really amazing to get to be here. And I got to go through the exhibition today and was absolutely blown away. I feel like this is a, a moment of possibility that you've created here. And it feels really, ex I'm excited about the future. So I hope you get to see the exhibition and we'll learn about the past, but also dream a little bit towards a different kind of world. So thank you again so much. And thank you to the sign language interpreter. Thank you.